Okay. All right. Well, uh, welcome everyone to Election Essentials with Jonathan Nicola and Christian Asperius from, fifth, from Our Turn Action Network and 50CAN. And we're excited to bring you our, I think, our fifth week of our webinar about uh, being active in elections. And, uh, you know, just reminding what it's all about. This is all about training advocates to impact elections. Christian and I do it professionally, and we love to see advocates transform their work to not just promoting issues, but, but also fighting for those issues and candidates to support those issues at the ballot box, because we think that's how you truly are um, the most effective advocate that you can be. And uh, we um, also, so we're gonna fo we focus on really fundamental topics and we'll, we'll continue to do that. We think we wanna give people the basics, but we think it's a content that everyone can use. People that have a little bit of experience to people who are starting off. Uh, we also give you some weekly news and insights that you can apply to your work. And we know there's a lot more out there to talk about. We always appreciate feedback. We know we don't have all the answers. Some of these things, there's a lot of nuance to. So we're always eager to learn and hear from others, just like we've learned a lot from other people uh, that have worked with us over the years. So Christian, why don't you talk about, we've got one last session. That, yeah, that's planned. Yeah. One last plan session. So why don't you talk one about One last plan session, yeah. Um, so today we're gonna learn all the questions you should be asking or the mindset you should be going into when you're starting a, a committee of whatever sort you might be joining. Um, and then next we're gonna talk about polling, how to write a poll, how to read a poll. Um, both of these are, are essentially the building blocks to, to launching either a 527 or a C4 or a number of other ways you can get involved. Um, and, you know, as always, if you have any recommendations or things you'd like us to cover, please send them in. I uh, want to give a shout out to people last week said this very in-depth things they want to cover, uh, kind of use this space for best practices as we're all going into election season pretty soon, uh, knowing just a lot of best tactics, how to use them, how to implement them, when to pull out. So we'll be going over some of these things uh, this week and next, but uh, any suggestions you have, please feel free to email us. All right, great. And then we're going to talk uh, soon. Christian and I will talk about where we go with this next and the feedback we're getting from people. And I, I think we want to continue doing this, uh, doing this webinar in some form or another. So keep, please give us a feedback. Let us know how we can make it better and more useful for you. I'm really, really eager about that. And uh, Christian, I think, you know, folks that have been on this uh, probably know a lot about you, but, you know, quickly remind folks yeah. about you. Yeah, as Jonathan said, I'm the, the, the national director of our turn action at work formerly students for education reform um you know our sole mission is to make sure that young people have a voice in in policy and, and electoral process and help craft the the policy and we've, i've been doing this for 10 years like jonathan said i've had the pleasure of working with jonathan on on the election and um that's how we met and kicked this all off um and so as jonathan mentioned we're not the be all end all of, of campaign strategy and and electoral work uh but we're here to be a thought partner and, and help provide solutions and practices from all the different races we've been in. Absolutely. And uh, for all, I'll surprise you with our off, uh, off bio topic uh, of the week. How, tell me about your family. How many children do you have? Because you've you got kids at home. What's that like? Yeah. And so first and foremost, my hat goes off to anyone <laughs> who's watching that has like a kid in school and you, you have to do the, the homeschooling and the teach at home. My, my heart goes out to you. I don't, I, I have a two year old and we just started uh, doing some like preschool things here around home. And uh, it is daunting to say the least. So I can only imagine how it is if you have real hard line curriculum and things of that nature. So one kid uh, and uh, I, and yeah, that's, that's me in a nutshell. Well, I uh, have th four children and, and it's been, it has been a challenge. They're at three different schools. So We've seen online learning, it's been very different. Each school is handling it a little differently. Uh, the biggest uh, issue is the kindergartner, the youngest, because he can't, you know, he can read, but he still needs help explaining or, or words he has difficulty with. So that's the hardest part, um, but it's, it has been an adjustment. I'm trying to work from home with kids uh, coming to my door asking me for help with things. So we're doing our best. But I'm, I'm at 50 Can and have been doing elections and advocacy for 18 years. I'm also a locally elected official. Really enjoy that a lot. Just, I love it. I think the thing I love about it the most is no matter what party you're in or what ideology you have, we can all get together and decide, do we need a playground here? 
do we need to fix that road here? It's just so practical. You know, there's sometimes there's arguments around ideological things, but it's just very practical and get things done. So I enjoy that. Uh, and I, you know, worked on all levels of, of uh, election. And then I have a book, The 50 Can Guide to Political Advocacy, that you can purchase on our website or download PDF for free. And a lot of the themes from the book we're talking about in the series. So uh, we'll get started this week. And uh, the, the topic this week is honestly one of the things I enjoy the most discussing, which makes me odd probably, but it is the, the most important questions to ask your lawyer. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna break it into sections about just getting started, what questions you ask, what kind of questions you ask once you're active, and then some miscellaneous questions. Uh, and then at the end, hopefully, you'll have some questions for us. If you do, you can go to the Q&A box in the um, uh, in, in your Zoom uh, menu there, and you can submit them, and we'll get to them at the end. But before we get started, uh, Christian, uh, I'd love to know, other than the scrub jay your family saw this week while you were out at the park, what, have, what did you find interesting this week? Yeah, I, give, I, I want to give a little insight to that inside joke. Jonathan is an avid nature lover, uh, and he's just made me one. Uh, I never, I love nature. I'm Californian. We have Big Sur. We have all these national parks here, and I love them, but uh, never knew anything about bird watching. And all of a sudden, I was on the walk, and I saw what I thought was a blue jay. I excitedly told Jonathan, and he told me, no, you're in California. You don't have <laughs> blue jays. So he helped me Google what bird I saw, and I saw a scrub jay, which... Uh, yeah, they're they're related. They're a related species, so you're good. You're okay. Close. All right. I've never seen a blue bird before. I was very excited. I'm a city guy. Uh, mm -hmm. But what's interesting this week is uh, this New York Times article about our state polls better than they used to be in 2016. I think everyone remembers 2016 and how all the polls were saying, you know, Clinton's going to win by a large margin, maybe the largest margin in, in, in history. Um, and right up until election day, you know, a few sites had that the polls had radically changed. Um, and the reason I think this is interesting is because there's so many, like anytime I, I mention a poll to the, to the common person, their automatic reaction is like, well, 2016, 2016, um, saying that like no one saw Trump winning, no poll, so they have no faith in polls. And so the reason I think this article is fascinating, it goes into like giving three major updates about what's different from 2016, better or for worse. And so the first one I wanted to share is like, Undecided voters. They're, they're figuring out how to make undecided voters either pick a candidate or ne uh, really judge where they lie if they're truly undecided or not. That was a bigger problem that we saw in 2016 that a large swath of undecided voters went for, for Trump. Um, and so what they're finding out now is like there's less undecided voters, which makes it a little easier to track these polls. And uh, we'll get into this a lot more next week, but uh, Jonathan and I were in a race where the polls just consistently kept telling us voters were undecided, voters were undecided. And I think that's a, a pivot point where a lot of campaigns and, you know, organizations have to make a decision on whether or not to pull the cord or if there needs to be a change in the strategy, especially if, if significant investment has been made. Um, the other thing that they noted is that they're, they're getting much better at weighing how much education factors and who you're going to vote for, um, you know, it, amongst party lines or amongst one candidate or another. But the last thing in this that said that could actually get worse uh, rather than better than 2016 is online polls. And we at our turn have in, engaged in online polling. And what we found, you know, this was two years ago now, maybe three, uh, what we found was that it was really unreliable and I think you know it was unreliable they've said the technology has gotten better but you know we talk about how people will take phone polls or even get canvas at the door or like a self-selecting group who want to participate and let their voices be heard uh, but I feel like online polls are even more self-selecting almost like the real diehards who want to share their opinion because they have to click on and say like yes I want to take a poll I want to tell people what I think about and so I think that skews the polls and so what this article goes on to say is like, it doesn't necessarily mean that online polls are bad or good. They, that they say that there are some sophisticated ones, but they aren't measured and weighted accordingly to like the larger demographic they represent, whether it's a congressional district, state or whatnot. So um, for a lot of us who have to rely on public polling because we don't have the funds to do poll, one thing I would like kind of like just tell people, you know, 
be really cautious when you're looking at like online polls. And if you can, and you have access to it, make sure to look at the cross tabs uh, and not just the top lines of these polls, because that's really where you can really make a decision on how to invest in the race or not. Great. Yeah, nothing to add. I'm really excited to talk more about this next week. And because there is cynicism about polling and you should be cynical. That makes you a, a good consumer of the polls, uh, but it doesn't mean polls are have no value. So I think it's, I'm looking forward next week to talking about that. Well, I am on the opposite. My, my, my interesting thing in the week is on the opposite end of polling. Christian's talking about the projections, and I'm talking about what data shows about the results in mine. Uh, it was an article in 538 that other people may have seen, but it was talking about Trump and his impact on down ballot Republicans. And honestly, you can insert any name, Biden, Clinton, Bush, Jimmy Carter, you know, just whatever, just go down the list. So what does, what does a top, what does the top of the ticket do to impact the, the bottom of the ticket candidates? And the 538 article asserted that um, every, for every point, that, um, let's see what they sound. They saw a 0.2 to 0.5 bump for every one point increase the presidential candidate experiences in the vote share. So, so I mean, they're, they're saying the candidate, you can probably attribute a strong top ballot candidate to half a point for every point. And there's a lot of science in this that you, know, you can read in the article. I'm not gonna try to sound smart and explain all that. But I guess what I would just tell folks is um, you, as, as an advocate, you absolutely need to be aware of the top ballot, top of the ballot. Um, sometimes you can't always predict how it's going to be. Like, I don't, no one can predict right now whether Trump or Biden are going to help or hurt candidates. And anyone who says that they do is wrong. Um, but you do have to try to make some guesses going into an election. Like, okay, how, how, could, how could this play out? And, and I think the unfortunate thing is sometimes a lot of great candidates lose because top of the ticket hurt them and a lot of really bad candidates win because top of the ballot hurt them or help them. Um, but, I, but what the research is showing is there's absolutely, um, there's absolutely a benefit to a, a winning presidential candidate in that district. So uh, something, to, something to think about. Um, I don't know, Christian, if you had a lot of experience with top of the ticket impacts, but um, that's, that's kind of what I, I, I can go at great lengths about this and coordinated races with parties and whether or not they help or hurt. Um, the, the stat that you shared, 0.1 to 0.5, like doesn't surprise me. That sounds about right, um, especially like how coordinated or not how coordinated it, the fit is for that state or district or whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Anyone who tells you they know for a fact how this is going to like hurt or help, um, it's probably lying to you at this point. That being said, you know, a lot of us here are starting to plan now for November or have already planned. And, you know, this is almost more, to, more of an art than a science at this point. But the hope is, you know, especially with websites like 538, that this actually leaves the art arena and goes into the science arena where you actually can tell how much of an impact they're going to have in a specific RD district. Um, I would say that we often, we being like politicals, often fall into like uh, a bubble of, of biases. And I've seen a lot of people say, well, the top of the, this is a blue wave at the, at the presidential election, Democratic turnout's gonna be through the roof. Um, and what people really don't realize is like, it might be through the roof on top of the ticket, but when you're involved in, in ballot initiatives and state legislator or municipal races, like it is a massive, massive drop off uh, to go all the way down on the ticket. Uh, unless there's a really specific coordinated race that ties it back to the top of the ticket. Right. Which is what their data is showing that it pulls you some of the way, but it doesn't pull you all the way. So. Well, anyway, we'll be interested to see more of that. I, I, I can guarantee you it will impact it, but right now I think it's a little early to start to know. But as we get more into polling, we're going to get to know more about that impact as the year goes on. So what are we talking about this week? We're talking about questions you need to ask a lawyer. And this is a really critical topic uh, because political work is highly regulated and that can scare a lot of people from involvement, but it is your protected right to engage in political speech. So um, some, ju some jurisdictions just try to make it a little complicated for you uh, to comply because there's so many rules, but it's really important not to be scared in inactivity 
and there's really always an answer for how to do it right. And I will make a note at the beginning of this that this is about people who are uh, looking to be involved. Again, we're focusing, this isn't candidate legal guidance. This is more about committees that will form around an issue or a group of people that form around an issue to support candidates that support their cause. So if you're looking for a can that's, that's our focus, not so much um, like what a candidate needs to know. But you know, we wanna reassure you, um, this slide uh, shows a copy of the diplomas that uh, Christian and I have from law school. Um, you'll see uh, there's nothing on the screen actually. Uh, Christian and I do not have law degrees. Um, uh, Christian, I don't think you graduated from law school. I didn't graduate from law school. So uh, we do have a strange fascination with campaign finance law, which helps us in our jobs. Uh, me dating back to high school, and we talk to lawyers all the time. And, and we actually have our, I'm gonna have our first poll. Uh, how many people on here have law degrees? All right, we'll just find out how many people out there. Because in politics, we find that a lot of people do have law degrees, and I'm not, not downplaying it uh, at all, but um, you know, that is a thing. But we're not going to give you legal advice. We want to be very clear about this on this call. But we're not, that's not a hedge for us to, to not give you important information. What we want to tell you are the questions you need to ask a lawyer. And a very, very simple uh, difference there because all the laws are different. We'll talk more about that. But, to be, but a lot of times, if you don't ask the right questions, you don't get everything you need. So, um, and there's only one lawyer on the call. So we can are on the webinar, so we can, uh, oh, two, I'm sorry, they were late. So there's only two people we have to be careful not to offend when we talk about lawyers, so. But anyway, so again, we're gonna focus on, we're gonna focus on questions to ask a lawyer so that you can go and be informed and, and get the right answers, know the right questions to ask. So let's start with, um, oops, let's start with, do you need a lawyer? So the answer to me, and Christian, if you're gonna do political work, is absolutely yes, you need a lawyer. Uh, the laws are highly variable from state to state, even, uh, even sometimes within, between municipalities they're different. You just, you just never know. You can't, you can't think, I know campaign finance, I was involved in the election in Indiana. Well, you're in Kentucky now. So don't, don't ever make assumptions. Also, there's a lot of nuance. Uh, sometimes, you have to report this if it costs $500, but if it costs $500, $501, you have to report something else. Uh, you have to, you know, there's all kinds of nuance in campaign finance law, things that are easily missed if you don't work with a lawyer. I often like to, when I work with a lawyer, and, and one thing they're helpful for is writing things down. Get, get something written down, like a memo that covers a lot of these issues so you can refer back to it. Um, that's a great use of a lawyer to get that done on the front end. And in general, when you work with a lawyer and why they're important is to ask first, act later. That's really important with lawyers and that's why they're great. You can ask all those questions first and then get to keep yourself out of making mistakes as opposed to making a mistake and then having to find out about it later. So lawyers are really important. And it is, you know, I understand they cost money um, you know, easily. You know, the range is vary from state to state, but it's definitely several hundred dollars an hour and that can add up to people, but you need to also look at the co political costs and the financial costs if you make mistakes, which can be staggering. So it, it, really is, it really is important. I, theoretically, if you just say, I, you know, if you're gonna ignore all of our advice and do it anyway, uh, the only thing I would tell you is you better have a lot of re really detailed conversations with the state election commission or local election commission. Write it all down, take notes about when they told you, who told you it. Uh, but even then, that's, it's still, their job is not to help you. I mean, they don't wake up every day to help you. You're not paying them to help you. But Christian, I don't know what you, what, if you have any more thoughts on this, uh, on the importance of it. I could not agree more, right? Like for some folks, who who have a C4, it could jeopardize that. It could, you know, it, it could be really, or it can be just really embarrassing, you know, by missing a f simple filing deadline, it makes you look amateurish, uh, makes you feel like you don't, uh, makes it appear that you don't have your act together. And, and again, that might impact the coalition you're with, the candidate you're trying to support, the issue you're trying to support, or, or maybe, you know, other partners in the group. Uh, the one thing I will say though, to your point that it, it could get expensive, 
that being said, is like one of the reasons I love this this training is because if you come prepared with knowing what questions to ask and the information you're seeking, you can save a whole lot of time and money. Um, mm -hmm. Being able to know what questions you need to ask and being fully prepared to walk into that conversation. Um, we're talking thousands upon thousands of dollars you can save by knowing what questions to ask and what information to be prepared. Absolutely. That's a great point. That's a great point. So here's, here's a couple, just to, just to frame up the discussion before we get to the questions. Um, there's pretty simple, there's pretty, pretty simple two buckets of things that you need to sort out legally. One is, what can you do? So just fundamental, what, what can I do to involve an election? Can I give donations? Who can give donations? Can I bundle checks to give to candidates? Uh, so that, that's the first bucket, big bucket that a lawyer is going to ask for you. What can you do? And then the second question, which we'll, we'll get into both of these more, which is what you have to report. So when you walk into the lawyer, those are the two things you're going to have to answer. Okay, what can I do and what can you report? And I would say for the most part, you can do almost anything you want. It's just about finding the right path to do that. And that's what a lawyer is for. So what I recommend doing as a, as a basic, even before we get to the detailed questions, is to tell the lawyer what it is you want to accomplish in this election. And then they can help you uh, work through the campaign finance law to do those things. So don't make assumptions like I need this committee, I need that committee or whatever. Just say, I want to do these things. I can raise money in this way. How do I need to organize? Uh, and, then, and then they'll tell you what the rules are. And occasionally, the rules may be too restrictive for you to want to do those things and you might, you might forgo it. But uh, usually there's an answer in there somewhere. So that's, um, that's kind of the key, the key things. And then we'll, we'll talk more about um, what you have to report, but uh, I think that's my next slide. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, what you have to report and the buckets for that are who gives to you and what you spend it on. So that's really the two things, contributions and expenditures. So th that's the framework you have to think about and who gives to you, corporations, individuals, other political committees, labor unions, you know, those are kind of the, the typical people that give to you. And, um, you know, we'll talk more about if those people can give to you, but that's one bucket. And then what you spend it on. Uh, and that's obviously things electoral related, but again, some, some states put different expenditures in different buckets. So those are the things you need to ask a lawyer. What can I do? How can I do it? And what do I have to report? So the reporting basics. So here's here again, these are the, these are the, the framework of how you approach this. Um, the first is where you file. So again, this is when you explain the lawyer what you want to do. You're going to tell them, like Christians in California, I want to do something in Los Angeles. Well, guess what? Los Muniz, city of Los Angeles, from what Christian explains to me, has their own election reporting. Um, some don't, some do. Some, some, some it's county-based, some it's state-based, some it's local-based. Um, do I have to file with the IRS or the FEC? So that's the first basic. Where do I need to file this information uh, that, that reports my political activity? Uh, the next is uh, what you file. So are, are we filing regular reports? Like does, 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 the, does, the, does the state or local municipality have a regular schedule? Um, also the IRS has its own reports that you have to file as a federally filed organization because all political committees still have to have an EIN number and file with the IRS to some degree. And then when do you file? You know, is it, how regular is it? Is it, are there regular reports? Some states say report when you do it. Some states say report within 24 hours. So, um, and if you're really lucky, you get to do all of it. <laughs> Some states make you do all of those things. So those are the basics. So when you, when you think about your reporting, when you talk to your attorney, you need to fill out each of those things. Where do I file? what do I file, and when do I file? So that's, those are the basics that you need to deal with. So um, now we're gonna get to some definitional terms for you. Uh, the first is 501s under IRS. The question is 501c4s versus 527s. And um, those, are, those are the two, um, two major types of IRS registrar organizations that can engage in political activity. 
and, uh, and they get thrown out a lot. We're going to talk about both. Um, 501c4s, by definition, are social welfare organizations, and they're primarily supposed to do lobbying. They're not primarily political organizations. The IRS says, hey, we understand that when you lobby, it's hard to avoid politics, so we'll let you do some political engagement. And you got to work with your lawyer on what that sum means, but usually it ranges between 35 to 49%, depending on your lawyer, of your money that can be spent on this. But you have to remember that a 501c4 is primarily um, a lobbying organization. 527s are primarily electoral. So that's where the IRS wants you to be political. Uh, and a 527 is anything that does politics. It's PACs, it's it's candidate committees, um, anything that's set up for the primary purpose of being political. And um, Christian, I think one of the things we talked about is, you know, how do we know which of those two organizations we need to have? You know, the lawyer will answer that for us, but, um, you know, is it, is it something you need just one or both? Or, you know, why would you just want a 501c4? You know, what's, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, this is a, a question that I get asked a lot on like which one to have or should we have both and you know it, this isn't the bailout answer but you ask your lawyer right it depends on the purpose that you're trying to get like the 527 description says here if your sole purpose is only to get people elected or only to push a, a bond or measure um, you know that's kind of like a 527 there's pros and cons to both the C4 and 527 ranging from how the money is spent, to disclosure laws, to a number of other things that that factor into this, um, but those those are like a you know the primary role of five twenty seven. Like you said here, is is strictly electoral work. Yeah. And the key difference, obviously, that most people go to for these two different IRS registered organizations are one does not have to report its donors to the IRS, which is C fours, and one does, which is five twenty sevens, and so. You know, a lot of people may gravitate to the 501c4 uh, for that reason, but, um, you know, and, and the Supreme Court has defended or, or upheld, I guess, the right of corporations which would, and labor unions, which would include C4s, to engage in political activity. Um, but they're really, they're really meant to be general treasury funds that come from those organizations to be spent on politics. And, um, and if you have to stay under that 50% number, if your primary purpose is to be involved in politics, why, if you want to spend $100,000 on an election, why, have to, why raise two hundred dollars to $250,000 just so you can spend one hundred? dollars So a lot of times, again, people go toward the 501c4, and I, I don't know if that should be their first choice. Um, I generally think you should have both if you're going to have an active political operation, because a 527 can be the, or 501c4 can be the parent organization for a 527 and they can share administrative costs in a lot of cases um, but anyway again take a look at that talk to your lawyer again about what you want to do and they'll help you work out which or both of these uh, IRS registered organizations are right for you but the interesting thing about campaign finance law and asking questions to your lawyers is that you can you can live in this IRS world 527 versus C4 it is important because you have to register as a, a nonprofit uh, entity. But the thing is, the states really could care less. Like the states don't care what the IRS thinks you are. They have their own set of terms for what you are. So you always have to remember and talk to your lawyer about, okay, what IRS box do I need to fit in? But then you need to ask them, what state box do I need to fit in? Um, because, you know, someone might start a 501c4, they know the Supreme Court lets them be involved in politics. They know the state lets corporations do donations or independent expenditures. But that doesn't mean the state doesn't want to know who your donors are. And the state has the right to ask who those donors are. Some do, some don't. Um, but you just need to be very understanding that to the state, they could care less. I call it, they're the IRS is the irrelevant revenue service to them. Uh, so the state's going to put you in different buckets too. They're gonna, they're gonna, mostly the state, states kind of work out, are you an individual? Are you a candidate? Are you a corporation or labor union? Or are you a political committee? So those are kind of the buckets that they're working in. 
And each one of those have different rules for what they have to report, when they have to report it, et cetera. And it's completely independent of the IRS. So um, to just be very clear on that uh, when, when you're doing it. Um, so I don't know, uh, Christian, if you have any comments on that, but it's, uh, I just want people to understand that they can't just assume IRS laws carry over to states. You gotta understand there's two different things going on. So. Anything to add, Christian, on that? No, and the only other thing is, you know, again, make sure you're making note of this as you're gonna approach your lawyer. So what's the difference between the federal law and the state law that you you have to apply for? And also some some people have 527 or C4s and they never activated them. Um, so make sure you come with that information. You know, I have a blank. Uh, so your attorney could help you tell you what it's gonna look like in that municipality or state or county that uh, has different disclosure laws and filing laws and everything. Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll just say straight up on the disclosure issue for people to understand. If you have a donor giving to you for primarily political purposes, whether it's, um, or specifically political purposes, whether it's uh, whether you're a C4 or 527, you should assume a state is going to have you report that. So, so again, don't don't um, don't get caught up too much in the disclosure issue. If someone's given for politics, the the law usually says in a the state they should be reported. So be aware of that. Another differentiating term that we're going to talk a little bit about, and that you want to talk to lawyers about, is coordinated versus independent expenditures. And uh, essentially, uh, independent expenditures are a way in states where they have very low contribution limits for you to help a candidate beyond that limit. Like, let's say uh, a limit in a state, you can only give a candidate $500 in a direct coordinated contribution. Well, you want to do a mail piece for the candidate that costs $1,000, so it's $500 more. Uh, every state, again, because of uh, Supreme Court uh, rules or Supreme Court rulings that have protected this, allows people or corporations or labor unions, et cetera, to conduct independent expenditures um, and, and, and accept unlimited contributions to do the independent expenditures. The issue is you can't tell the candidate about it. So it's really important. Um, is, is the candidate or someone helping the candidate aware of what you're doing? Uh, if it is, it's coordinated. And in that case, you can't spend more than $500 on that, in my example. But if it's not coordinated, you can spend unlimited amounts to help the candidate because again, the Supreme Court has said that uh, you have the free speech there. So again, the independent expenditures allow you to exceed contribution limits in a legal manner. Uh, but what I would tell you is don't be cute about it. This is probably one of the most severe penalties if you violate it for you and the candidate. And so just be really important about it. You can, uh, again, this is where you need to talk to your lawyer because your lawyer is gonna tell you what the triggers are in your state or city for what an independent expenditure is. Uh, so that's, that's, this definition is something you need to really work with your attorney on. Um, and you know, generally, again, the lawyer will explain it. Uh, generally, uh, if it's something's in the public domain, you can use it. That's like Christian and I might go to campaign finance reports and see what the candidates reported. That's public information. We saw an ad they put on television that informs us something. So generally, if it's public information, you can use it to inform your independent expenditures. But if it's private information, no. So just don't be cute about it. I, I tell people, make sure you understand that um, very clearly. So we're gonna, where, do our, where are our specific question list now? So Christian and I are going to kind of do a back and forth and each take a question and just explain it. Uh, first question is, what type of organization can engage in a political activity? So again, that's um, uh, what type of organization? Do I need a PAC? Do I need an, an expenditure committee? Every state is gonna have different kinds of organizations that register to do political activities. And so that's the first type of um, question. That's the first question I would ask an attorney. Christian? Yeah, what triggers the registration of political committee? This is pretty simple. Are you spending money? Like, are, are you raising money and spending money that would typically trigger you registering a political committee. Right, in some states they have a dollar amount, like if you go over this, some states um, under, and so that's my question, Does you, do you need the organization to be registered before you do anything? And sometimes yes, sometimes 
if you hit a certain dollar threshold, then you report. Um, but you need to know that because before you do anything, you need to know the answer to that question so that you don't make a misstep. What are the nuts and bolts of, of registration? We kind of covered some of this, but you're going to most likely need officers like a treasurer, uh, someone who's responsible, name and goal to organization. You're going to need a bank account. Um, again, that varies state to state. Um, and you're going to have, need an entity. These are the nuts and bolts. You're going to have to come prepared uh, in order to set these things up. And then one that I think a lot of people forget is how do I pay administrative costs? So if you're doing political activity, uh, you can either volunteer your time, which is fine, or which means you got to work after hours. But let's say you work for a company or a nonprofit organization, et cetera, um, or, a, or a 501c3 type organization. Those entities can't pay you to work on politics. So how are you going to pay the administrative costs? And how does the state allow you to do that? So um, do you have to report the cost of the administrative costs on your reports? Um, do you not have to, you know, the, all those kind of things. So uh, make sure you ask the lawyer that question as well. So moving on, once you are active, Christian, I'll let you take the first one. So how do you set up for online filing? It, it's, it's not complicated, I promise, even though it might seem. Uh, but you, um, you have to make sure all the things we just went over previously, uh, are, are your ducks in a row. When you're spending money, when you're raising money, um, everything that has a dollar value, this is something you have to set up for an online filing. Yeah. And it takes time too. I think one thing I think we're going to get to later, but like, if you have to file a report by a certain date, you need to make sure you know the online filing process so that you can be you know, be prepared to file that. Uh, what is reported? So we talked about that. Do I have to report? Um, how do I report it? Uh, do I need to itemize? Sometimes they ask me to itemize things. Sometimes they ask you for like the occupation of a donor. Sometimes they ask you for the legislative district of a candidate. Sometimes they don't care who the candidates were that you were supporting. Do they just want to know the, the, the business that you paid for the expenditures? So so you need to go over the lawyer in great detail with the kind of things that need to show up in the report and how they need to be reported. When is it reported? So when are these things reported? Again, this varies. In some states, they're, mm -hmm. they're quarterly. And then as it gets closer and closer to election day, it becomes monthly, weekly, and then 24 hour cycles. Um, in other states, it's just the rule of thumb. It's 24 hours of uh, filing a report. So it varies, again, these are the kind of questions you need to make sure you're going into your lawyer. So you set up for your calendar um, because if you do miss a filing deadline and you do miss to report something, again, it, there's a number of things that could happen. If you're a habitual violator of this, it could mean a lot of fines. In some states, it could mean losing, you know, your, your 527. It could mean, and I, I've heard in other states, you could lose like your right to vote in that state. So uh, there's a lot of consequences if you don't report on time and accordingly. Yeah, absolutely. All right, next thing, is there special reporting? So, and this is kind of a, an addendum to Christians when it's reported. We wanna double down on the fact that there might be special reports that the state doesn't necessarily hide, but it's, it, this is where the nuance comes in. I've, had, I've been in states where they have regular reporting, but if any time got, they got a donation over a certain amount, we had to report it within 24 hours. So it, that totally threw me for a loop at first because I know state had done that before. So that specific thing, getting a large donation, required a special report no matter when it was during the year. Uh, other states, again, Christian said 24 hours, 48 hours. So again, just flag that there are often special reports and you need to, every, what I do every time I approve an expenditure is I think, I consciously think did that trigger any of these things that requires a special report. So. Um, Every time you do something, even if it's in like, you know, it's nine months before the election, still train yourself to think, is there any kind of, we just proved this payment. Is there any kind of special report that I have to do for it? So it's generally close to the election, but I would just say, don't take it for granted. All right. Oh, next one. Disclaimers. This is, uh, this is me being really nerdy and liking election law. Uh, disclaimers look a myriad different ways on a myriad different things from what it, on some states and municipalities, you have to put a disclaimer on the script, on the phone banking script. 
Uh, not only does it have to be red, but it has to be in a certain font size on the white sheet of paper that you are the only one who's going to see it. Um, to things like uh, you got to make sure you report the top five donors on every political digital ad or TV ad. So disclaimers come in a multiple different ways uh, from font size to exact wording uh, to bold, italicized, um, and a rate of speech that you have to say it if it's a recording. Um, so disclaimers, 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 they, they look a myriad different ways. And again, when you're talking to your lawyer and you're asking, you're telling them, I want to do X, make sure to ask them specifically, what's the disclaimer for that specific activity from phone banking, canvassing, so on and so forth. It's going to look very different for every, um, for every tactic, uh, even if it's within the same race. Yep. Absolutely. And uh, one, one helpful tip, if the name of your organization is very long and they require disclaimers on radio or television ads, uh, be aware because that's going to eat into the time you have <laughs> for your ads. So, yeah. I've made that mistake plenty of times. All right, uh, what counts as a contribution? So that's another thing that uh, is related to independent expenditures. So does my volunteering for this candidate count as a contribution? Uh, obviously, a uh, a physical check to the candidate counts, but there's other kind of things like we talked about in-kind contributions. We talked about that as tactics, you know, I think last week or the week before. And if I buy food for a fundraising event, do I have to report that? You know, some states say no, some states say yes. So most states say yes, by the way, just so you know. But there is nuance to that. So make sure you ask them, what kind of things can I do for a candidate that requires me to report? And one reason why this is important is because if you are not forming a political committee, you're just helping the candidate um, and you want to just maybe provide them advice or be part of the kitchen cabinet, you need to be very careful that you are not inadvertently flipping one of those triggers we talked about earlier um, that require you to file a committee. And so if you're doing something that's a contribution to a candidate, even if it's not cash, uh, that can flip that trigger. So you just need to be very cognizant of that. So, so ask your lawyer what counts as a can contribution to the candidate. Um, so those are, those are kind of our questions. I don't know, Christian, you think we missed anything or anything off the top of your head that you want to add to those? Uh, no, just the last, uh, last part, you know, there's a lot of new ones, but I think a, a good example that I personally encountered with when it's something like, I want to donate you know, donuts to be the donuts and coffee every morning for that voter registration drive you're going to have uh, from now until election day. And that could accumulate to where you break a threshold of, okay, now you have to disclaim, disclose it. Um, and there's, again, talk to your lawyer, but there's a lot of entities that allow, you know, just general nice things like donuts, not breaking that threshold. Um, you know, whether it's you're coordinating directly with a state party, state parties have different rules when it comes to filings and things of that nature. Um, yeah. But one thing to always think about when you're doing any kind of political activity, everything has a dollar value. Your time, especially if you're doing something between the hours of nine to five, like you have to, you have to account for that when you volunteer on the campaign. Um, but also any kind of just niceties, generosities, you, it has a price tag and it will count against a candidate or issue that you're trying to support. So be cognizant of that. Uh, as you're volunteering or helping or being part of a coalition. Yeah, and, and Christian's right. And one clarification, I, I think just because I Christian's right. If you're volunteering your own time, generally, and you should also ask, generally, that's not a donation to a candidate. They usually make exceptions for that. What Christian is, is getting at is if you're volunteering on behalf of your organization. So my organization's paying me to help you. That That's usually a cost. So and so be very be very clear about that um, when you're counting your time, like Christian said. So we're gonna so we just got a couple quick things and then we'll take questions and, and wrap up here. So just some miscellaneous filings that people often forget because when they set up a political committee, it is an organization and organizations have payroll filings they have to do occasionally. Uh, they have corporate filings. You might have to in a lot of states require uh, entities to have a corporate filing to be active in their state. Also, the IRS has several different filings for political committees and 501c4s, including the annual 990 that I know probably a lot of people um, do. So anyway, just those are a few, a few other things. And then uh, accounting. So we want to emphasize accounting. So uh, 
it's really important to be detail oriented in political work because you can be audited. Every every penny can be can be audited and accounted for. So uh, make sure you have someone on your team um, that does that very well, and you should do it as well. You should make a habit of of not don't don't let that get away from you. A lot of important political committees and candidates have been have been brought da brought down because they didn't do a good job of taking care of their money. Uh, and one thing I like to do is checks and balances for content and financial approvals. So I like to have someone who's in charge of looking at things from a, a legal and financial perspective. Like, do we have the money in the bank? Can we do this? And then the other person looking at it from a content perspective, do we actually want to write this donation to a candidate? Do we want to do an independent expenditure that says the following? So I like to have checks and balances and usually a couple people who understand the campaign finance law because uh, I like to have two people on my team who understand the law, at least to some degree, so that uh, we don't miss things. But it's really important, I think, to have a couple people in the, in the at least two people in the mix um, for checks and balances and so things don't get missed. And then uh, track contributions closely because states often limit how much you can give to a candidate. So if you give them $100 once and then $250 later and then you know, your last donation was for $500. You think, well, that's under the limit. Well, but if you count the previous donations, you're over. So again, track your contributions to candidates very closely. And then uh, lastly, like other trip ups that often happen from a legal perspective, uh, robocalls. Uh, Christian was talking about those. Um, we talked a little bit about them a couple weeks ago at the Supreme Court. Uh, he was talking about disclaimers. There, are, the state has robocall laws often and the FCC has robocall laws, and you need to comply with both. So just because the state says this is what you have to do, um, the FCC has its own rules, and including telling people on the front end who they, the call is from, on the back end, including a phone number so people can call uh, if they have an issue with your robocall. So again, remember there's a couple different uh, dynamics of robocalls. So before you just jump into those, make sure you get all those answered. Um, another thing that's kind of a thing of the past, but um, make sure you understand whether your organization is allowed to say vote for or against a candidate, or whether you have to generally just talk about the importance of an issue and, and often mention a candidate's name. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's an important nuance there. Some states regulate them the same, some states regulate them differently. So just understand with your attorney what kind of organization you need to be. And if you are that latter group, the issue advocacy group, um, you're going to have to have a lot of lawyer time reviewing what you're writing to make sure you don't accidentally become a vote for or vote against organization. So, um, and then timing. Um, that's, oh, I, I know. That, that's just a reminder that it takes time to set these things up. So if your election is, you're a month out from the election, you haven't set up any of these committees or bank accounts, just understand it takes time to go down to the bank and give them the paperwork they need. It takes time to register with the IRS. It takes time to register with your state. It takes time to get the money in the door to pay the bills. Like just because the donor says yes, doesn't mean you're gonna have that money tomorrow to spend. So just understand you need to build in the timing for all these legal and financial requirements um, on the front end of when you wanna start. It's kind of work backwards. When do you wanna start doing things? and then add two, three weeks on the other side of it to make sure you get all your paperwork and all these legal questions um, taken care of. So with that, Christian, that is our, uh, that is our time we have for um, legal questions. And um, we have a couple questions. And uh, one is related to the relationship between uh, C3, C4s, in 527 it's in terms of uh, board governance, giving money back and forth, staff support, et cetera. So Christian, what, what's your experience uh, with that um, topic? Quite a, quite, a, quite a bit, to be honest. Uh, and I think uh, going back to your time thing, the other thing we should take in time specifically about this issue is like the amount of time you, you talk to your lawyers on things of this nature, of like transferring money from one entity to the other, when is it? okay how does the board governance look like um so typically between c3 and c4 
some, some organizations have it where they have different board members. Uh, they have a C3 board and a C4 board. Some have the same board members with different chairs and different, you know, a committee session. So, um, you know, if, if Eric, if you have any further questions about exactly what you want to get into the, the entities about C3 and C4s, uh, but, you know, you, this is something that's really kind of um, an administration level thing of, uh, of allocating how much time you spent on doing, whether it is lobbying versus, you know, issue advocacy um, and just making sure that the, the money is reported properly and make sure that you are following all the laws that, that your lawyer has recommended you to set up to. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. My additional things that I would say about that topic is uh, C3s and C4s kind of a relationship and C4s and 527s kind of a relationship. But C4s is like the buffer because C3s and 527s should really never touch. The IRS allows C4s to have a little bit of political action activity, so they, that allows them to have that uh, relational, uh, racial relational connection between the, the with the 527. But the IRS gives C3s no um, allowance for that. So a, a good way to think of it is no, no C3 dollars should ever benefit a candidate or political committee ever. So that means if you work for a 501c3, the 501c3 cannot pay you to go and uh, execute your political committee. Um, and, and one, you know, if people want to understand in their mind why that's different is um, a C3 takes tax deductible money. So the IRS has decided that tax deductible money can be used for charitable expenses. It cannot be used for political expenses. So that C3 money can't go up the chain and benefit a political committee. Uh, so that's, it's really important to make sure you have the right hat on. And again, with the administrative costs to make sure you have um, the administrative costs covered so that you can legally do the things you need to do um, under the C4. Um, but you know, uh, the same board members, like, you know, again, this is where the lawyer is gonna, every lawyer has a little different risk level, but generally speaking, there's no reason someone can't be on a C3, C4 and 527 board. Um, their names can even be similar. Uh, they don't have, as long as they're not the exact same organization, the names can be similar. Uh, it's just really important, again, that C3 money does not touch a, or benefit a political committee. To me, that's the most important, um, that's the most important uh, nuance, um, I think. So, well, and obviously happy to talk more with people about that. As, as folks have questions, you're always able to contact Christian or myself uh, on our emails. I think my email is on the registration page, and, and I think Christian's maybe as well. And we can always um, give you some guidance and help you understand more about that relationship if you need to go talk to a lawyer. So I don't know if we have any other questions this week. Um, hopefully that was not too boring, but uh, really important. And I just would encourage you if you, um, you know, was going a little fast for you, we're going to put this on YouTube, we'll send it out the next day or two. You can go back and look and write those questions down again that you might have missed, and um, you know take those with you when you go talk to your lawyer, and you'll be ready for political activity. And uh, Christian, uh, next week we're going to talk about, like I said, your favorite topic. Um, anything else you want to add about polling before we uh, before we go? No, other than I'm going to nerd out, and uh, if you have any other fellow nerds about who love polling, invite them to join. Uh, the more the merrier. Uh, and then again, any questions or any specific poll you'd like us to cover or poll questions to help you maybe diagnose if it was the right question to ask or how to interpret it, send it on over. Uh, we're going to be looking at a lot of different polling, a lot of different questions um, to help kind of give you a bearing of how to, how to analyze things, whether you're receiving a poll or whether you're asked to craft a, a few questions for a poll. Gotcha. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we're really pleased to keep doing this and we hope it's helping you be more effective political advocates. So everyone have a great week. Thanks.